Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our Head and Neck Anatomy series. In this video, we're going to be talking about the muscles of mastication. So the muscles of mastication are muscles involved with moving the mandible, providing the ability to chew or masticate. They're formed from the paraxial mesoderm of the first pharyngeal arch. This is that mesodermal tissue that develops on either side of the neural tube in the embryo. And as we talked about in our second video, it's also responsible for forming the posterior skull. Since it's coming from the first pharyngeal arch, it's no surprise that these muscles are being innervated by the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, specifically the third division of cranial nerve 5. All of the muscles of mastication originate from the skull in a place other than the mandible, and they insert into the mandible to allow it to move. So we'll go from outside to inside and start with the masseter muscle. Now for every muscle that we review in this video and in the videos to come, we'll recite the origin, insertion, and action for every single muscle. Innervation is the other high yield thing to know for every muscle, but I'll usually point that out at the beginning of a muscle group, and oftentimes each muscle in that group is innervated by the same nerve, which makes things a whole lot easier to remember. So the masseter is actually broken into two distinct parts, a superficial part that we can clearly see, and a deep part that's peeking out behind the superficial part. So the superficial part has oblique or diagonally running fibers, and they originate at the anterior two-thirds of the zygomatic arch and insert into the lateral surface of the ramus down to the angle. The deep part has vertical running fibers. It also originates from the zygomatic arch, but a bit more posteriorly, and it also inserts into the lateral surface of the ramus as well as the angle. I always think of a muscle like a rope. The origin is where a person who is standing still is pulling the rope towards them. And the insertion is what's ever on the other end of the rope getting pulled toward that person. So the origin is immobile and the insertion is mobile. And the muscle is what's controlling that movement. So what is the masseter's action or function? Well, it elevates or closes the mandible. And this makes perfect sense because the primary direction of those fibers is running up towards the zygomatic arch, pulling the insertion toward the origin. Secondarily, the superficial fibers can actually protrude the mandible forward, while the deep fibers can retract or retrude the mandible after it's been protruded. And again, this makes sense just looking at the orientation of those muscle fibers. Lastly, if a masseter muscle is activated only on one side, it can move the mandible toward that side. So if the left masseter activates, it can move the mandible to the left. I'm going to show you something a little bit later towards the end of the video to help you remember this. Another way to say this is that unilateral action produces ipsilateral excursion. That's a lateral movement toward the same side. So if we cut away the masseter and the zygomatic arch, we see the full temporalis muscle. The temporalis muscle originates in the temporal fossa, which we spent a whole lot of time talking about in our fossa video, specifically along the temporal line. It inserts into the coronoid process of the mandible, and it functions to elevate or close the mandible, which again, makes sense. If we just look at the orientation of those fibers, the pull is going to be parallel to those fibers. Again, the origin is located above the insertion point, so it will pull up on the mandible at its coronoid process. Secondarily, the posterior fibers, which run a bit more obliquely, can retrude or retract the mandible back. If we cut away the ramus and go even further in toward the infratemporal fossa area, we see the medial pterygoid muscle down here. This one also has a superficial and a deep part, 
just like the masseter did. The superficial part here originates at the tuberosity of the maxilla and also the pyramidal process of the palatine bone. The deep part originates from the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate, and this is how it gets its name, not from it being the lateral pterygoid plate, but that it's originating from the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate. It inserts into the medial or internal surface of the ramus down to the angle, basically on the opposite side that the masseter attaches to it. It elevates the mandible and provides some protrusion. Again, just look at the direction of the pull of the muscle fibers. Now, if a medial pterygoid muscle is activated only on one side, it moves the mandible toward the opposite side. So if this left medial pterygoid is activated, the mandible will move to the right. In other words, unilateral action produces contralateral excursion. Last but not least, we have the lateral pterygoid muscle. And this one has a superior and inferior head. The superior head originates at the infratemporal crest, and that's the superior border of the infratemporal fossa, and it inserts into the articular disc and joint capsule of the temporomandibular joint. The inferior head originates lower down at the lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid plate, hence the name lateral pterygoid muscle, and it inserts into the condylar neck at a depression known as the pterygoid fovea. Now both superior and inferior head work together to pull the disc and the condyle forward and down the articular eminence, and this initiates jaw opening and protrudes the mandible. As with the medial pterygoid muscle, unilateral action produces contralateral excursion. Now I'm bringing back this image that I showed you in the last video on fascial spaces because honestly this gets really cool. So this is a cross-section view technically from the front of the skull looking at the right side of the head. We have the zygomatic arch out here, the mandible with the coronoid process cut through and the condyle sitting behind it. We have the temporal bone up here, the infratemporal crest over here, and the lateral pterygoid plate right here. Now, all four muscles that we just talked about with all of their origins and insertions are shown in this image on the left. And those muscles make up those four masticator spaces we discussed in the last video. And then I showed you this simplified drawing to make a diamond to help you remember how all of those muscles are positioned and all those bones are positioned to make up those four quadrants. But we can also use this drawing for another purpose. So all we have to do is highlight the mandible. And I told you before, I have a really easy way to remember the excursion direction of each of these muscles. So check this out. The temporalis is going to pull on that mandible straight up. So there's no excursion there. The masseter pulls on the mandible outward. So it's going to pull the mandible toward that same side. Both pterygoid muscles pull in on the mandible. So they're going to want to pull it toward the opposite side. Now you can also see how the temporalis, the masseter, and the medial pterygoid all pull up on the mandible, effectively closing it, while the lateral pterygoid pulls the mandible straight so it moves forward, and as a result of that will also move down along the natural slope of the articular eminence. So that's pretty darn cool. So that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to this channel for more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do here, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to all of my patrons here for their support. 
You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone and I'll see you in the next video.